Well, I'd like to welcome everybody to the um, FMA and Malay Arts Chronicles. Of course, this is Guru Mike Schwartz, your host. I have with us today Mr. Glenn Doyle, uh, instructor and family inheritor of the uh, Irish stick fighting system utilizing the shillelagh. How are you today, Mr. Doyle? Very good. How are you? Great. Fantastic. Can you begin by telling us uh, a little bit about uh, how you got involved with uh, martial arts uh, in general, if you would? Uh, Well, my actual first instructor was my father. Um, When I was four, uh, he started me in the basic principles of boxing because my dad was a boxer. Um, He used to box for the Canadian Forces when he was uh, on active duty and whatnot. Um, And so he was probably my first uh, introduction into the uh, fighting arts. Um, And then eventually, when I turned about 16, 17, I eventually got into the Chinese arts. Um, But it was a little later in life, so my first experience would probably be my dad. In, in boxing when I was about four years old. And was your uh, was your father very encouraging about you learning the diff- uh, a fighting system, so to speak? Um, yeah, I guess you could say he was encouraging. I mean, he just kept punching at me until I punched back. So if you want to call that encouraging, um, he really wanted. He knew I wasn't going to be a big guy because my dad was only about five foot four, and my mom was only like five foot even. So he mm-hmm. knew I wasn't going to be a giant. <laughs> And um, I think uh, he made that decision way back when that he wanted me to definitely uh, play around with the fighting arts just to, you know, maybe give me a a good shot at a a happy life. (laughs) So um, he was very supportive, but he was very, very firm, though. I mean, it wasn't really – I wouldn't say I had a choice when he first started. It wasn't like he said, do you want to, or if he waited until I was interested in something. It was was pretty much – kind of put on the plate and put in front of me, and I kind of had to deal with it, So, which I'm grateful for now. But when you're a kid – you kind of aren't, aren't, you know, all into it at that time. You know what I mean? So. Of course, of course, of course. Yeah. And so as many fathers do, I'm sure he took pride in your success. Did you compete in such things like uh, amateur boxing or golden gloves at any point? Uh, I did. All my competitions were in the, on the Kung Fu circuits uh, later on when I got into the Kung Fu. Um, and uh, I managed to, to grab three Canadian titles. So, um, you know, he's pretty happy with that. I mean, I think he would have liked me to get into the boxing and the pugilism, mm-hmm. but um, I uh, I didn't really go that way. Uh, I just, uh, I love the boxing for um, for the hand coordination, for the footwork. I love mm-hmm. it for the endurance and the, and the conditioning. Mm-hmm. Um, but I really kind of just got kind of drawn towards the Asian arts for a while. And between the, you know, ages of 16 and 23, 24, it was like, I was really, really immersed in the Asian arts, and that's when I did all my competing. So, so uh, initially, you were, um, uh, as a youth, uh, you were exposed to boxing by your father. And so uh, from from that point until uh, about uh, your early teens, 15, 16 years old, uh, that was your primary source of martial contact then, correct? I, yeah, well, when I, became, when I turned seven, because um, my dad wanted to wait until I was a little older, that's mm-hmm. when he first introduced me to the sticks to the mm-hmm. stick fighting, our, mm-hmm. our family system. I was about seven at that. So I had about three years of boxing kind of, if you can call it under my belt. I mean, you know, how much, you know, can you do when you're, you know, four years old? But, uh, you know, I had that ex- three years ex- experience on just punching and mm-hmm. footwork of boxing. And then um, he just grabbed uh, the stick. And one day when we were having our lesson, I thought I was getting a boxing lesson. And he slapped the, his fighting stick into my hand and goes, okay, now you're going to do this. And that was when I was seven. So um, just... Before I got into the to the Asian arts, um, I had uh, the stick background from about seven to to well till he passed away. But from seven to sixteen, I had kind of the mix of the boxing and the sticks. So. I see, I see. And and so the the uh, the Irish stick fighting art was this uh, apparently this was a family system, correct? Yes, it was passed down father to son, father to son. My granddad taught my dad, my great granddad taught my granddad and all the way down the lineage from the family came over to Canada, went to North America, in and around, I believe it was around 1867-ish. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, and they brought that kind of system over to, and we, they settled in Newfoundland. I mean, the story about uh, my great-great-grandfather who, who left to Ireland, um, he was leaving to get away from trouble, quote-unquote, so we won't even try to go there, what that was about. But there were two ships. Um, docked, and he didn't even know which one he got on. He just grabbed the ticket and got on one. And it turned out one was going to Boston, Massachusetts, and the other one was going to St. John's, Newfoundland. So that's how we ended up in Newfoundland, um, just by chance. And when he settled there, um, there's a huge, like, there's a really strong Irish community uh, in the Avalon Peninsula of Newfoundland. 
I mean, if you go there, the names are all Irish, Murphy, Doyle, Kelly, you know, Dunphy. Mm -hmm. Um, So when he settled there, um, all the Irish kind of settled in this one little area. So it was kind of like you left home, but you didn't. The Irish traditions and the customs really stayed strong and rooted in that Newfoundland community. So I think that really helped kind of keep the system alive and the fact that, you know, the, the traditions were still kind of, to pushed on to the to the younger generations where as now you know with the you know the cosmopolitan you know kind of canada america kind of stuff it's sometimes a lot of the old traditions get lost mm-hmm. so i think uh, we were pretty lucky in that regard because i think if he had settled in some place that was a little more big city i don't know if the style would have got passed on as much as it did i mean I'm, I'm speculating but it just seems that way but kind of the old small town kind of community feel i think really helped kind of keep preserve the style and keep it going Sure, sure, sure. And so, can you tell me a little bit uh, about the tradition of uh, of the Irish uh, stick art uh, of utilizing the shillelagh? Um, well, I think it was uh, born of necessity. I mean, I think the stick art, the stick fighting, um, had always been like. Um, there's a gentleman in the United States, uh, John Hurley, who's uh, done so much research on Irish history, especially of, of the stick arts and the fighting factions and whatnot. And I'm sure you know he could give you a really capsule, detailed. Uh, uh, breakdown, but the stick was always kind of a part of it with the hurling games and whatnot. But it was also, I think, the easily easiest, readily available weapon to get your hands on. Mm-hmm. Um, and with uh, you know, with the um, the English kind of really kind of keeping tabs on what people were doing and stuff, you know, you really didn't have access to weapons. Uh, even swords were really hard to come by. So I think you know, necessity is the mother of invention. And I think the stick, because you know, walking sticks are walking sticks. You know, I mean, you can't really. Uh, it's hard to control people having a walking stick when they're going down the street or whatever. And I think that kind of facilitated the style starting to, to emerge and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. a lot of um, the one-handed the Irish style, they look a lot like fencing. I mean, there's a lot of, uh, of sword-like movements, but because you don't have the edged weapons, you've got to change the, the, the trajectory of your blow or how you come in. Mm-hmm. But you can see kind of the sword play influence in, 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 the, in the one-handed system. Mm-hmm. So... Um, that's, I think, it was through necessity, uh, much like, you know, uh, any of the other, um, I know that some of the, um, the uh, FMA systems, the, 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 the Filipino stick fighting systems, kind of have a similar uh, uh, background um, in the fact that, you know, swords weren't readily available, but the stick was, right? right. And it was that kind, of, that kind of motion. So, I, I mean, I think it was a kind of a similar history in that regard, mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. You, you were oppressed and you couldn't get your hands on a weapon, so you, you want to grab anything you can, mm-hmm. and because sticks are uh, so readily available pretty much anywhere, it makes kind of sense that it was uh, sure. kind of sure. wrapped up and used. You know? Understood, understood. And so you, you had made a, distinguish, uh, uh, a distinguishing remark. You, you said that there, were, um, there was a single-handed or a one-handed system as well as a two-handed system. Can you, can you tell me a little bit more about that and what, um, what determined the, um, uh, the propagation of both, I guess, and how they were developed? Okay, uh, well, the one-handed system, I mean, uh, a lot of my history is coming from what my dad told me. Mm-hmm. Um, now, our, our family system way back when um, was originally one-handed, mm-hmm. um, and then it was my great-great-great-uncle, I believe. I don't know how many greats I'm going to put on the end of it, but it was, sure. it was uh, a relative who had a pugilistic background who um, eventually uh, went from the one-handed and decided to drop both hands onto the stick because in the faction fights, um, you know, it's just a brouhaha and there's bodies everywhere. And for the big swings, you know, half the time you're hitting your own people mm-hmm. because everything was so close quarters. So mm-hmm. um, this uncle, when he, when he dropped his stick into two hands and used the principle of pugilism, added on to the strikes from the original one-handed system, um, according to my dad, he found it much more uh, complete because he was a lot more devastating in his hits and he wasn't uh, hitting anybody that shouldn't be uh, mm-hmm. and he can control his space. Uh, his fighting space is a lot e- more easily controlled. So, I mean, that was the evolution of, of where our style went two-handed. Um, now, the one-handed, uh, the advent of the one-handed was basically, uh, from what I can understand, and again, John Hurley would be the guy to talk to, but my understanding of it is fencing instructors would, be, would be teaching uh, anybody who wanted to use the stick. And again, you know, you don't have your edge and you, you don't have your stab, mm-hmm. but you do have that, that sword motion. So I think uh, the old fencing instructors or any kind of sword play instructors that could be found were the ones that were helping kind of put something together for the, the single-handed stick fighters. 
um, which is why you would have that kind of motion if you see a one a single handed style or one handed stick fighting style from Ireland. Uh, again, you'll see the footwork's very very sword based, very fencing based. Um, and I mean, it wasn't fancy, and there were no there were no whirling strikes or anything. It was just you know downward strikes, upward strikes, just trying to hit your opponent. With the uh, with the single uh, single hand base with the system, single. yeah, mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Now, w- would you would you believe that that perhaps this may have been influenced uh, at some point or at some part uh, due to the um, the uh, British invasion and perhaps the the British uh, influence, so to speak, with uh, with their particular militaristic um, background and, and perhaps uh, uh, insisting that that some some of the culture be somewhat corrupted with that? Um, how, how would you mean by corrupted? Well, <laughs> uh, sure. No, not a problem. Uh, and this is just a reference point. In, uh, obviously, in a lot of, uh, a lot of civilizations uh, throughout the world, uh, due to, um, due to countries that, uh, uh, that may have, uh, come, whether it was through discovery or whether it was uh, through uh, militaristic inhabitants, uh, much as the United States during uh, immediately after uh, World War II had prohibited the use of the sword and things of that nature. Uh, mm-hmm. At some point, you know, the, the certain weapons, particularly perhaps bladed weapons or what have you, may have been banned in the particularly uh, traditional manner that they were used to uh, being used before. Would you think right. that that perhaps may have developed the single hand system so that it was more um, and, and euro or more more British in nature, so to speak? It could very well be. Yeah, I mean, I I wouldn't claim to be a historian to to um, I guess speak authoritatively like mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. But I mean, I understand your point, and I would kind of lean towards saying yes. I I, I would think so. Um, I mean, you know, they were, it was, it was a pretty, uh, it was a pretty tight coverage, <laughs> uh, I point. And I know that a lot of, um, some of the fencing masters or, or I guess the, the fencing instructors or sword play instructors that came back to Ireland, I know a lot of them had served in the British army. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's probably where they learned it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when they came back, uh, they tried to pass it on whether they were supposed to or not. Uh, I mean, that's the question mark, but I, I'm pretty sure. I remember uh, making reference to that, that a lot of the uh, old kind of instructors, like back when it was first really mm-hmm. getting out there, probably had trained with uh, a foreign army of some sort to learn the actual sword play. Sure, right. sure, sure. And yeah. again, and again, part of that influence, of course, goes uh, goes to the uh, uh, the systems. Uh, Many of the systems with, uh, uh, within Europe, such as the uh, French Lacan, uh, as well mm-hmm. as um, uh, in, in Italy, they have uh, Nova Scrimia now, uh, which mm-hmm. is uh, a development that, that it has historic roots in the uh, initial uh, introduction to sword play for the individuals because the stick became their training blade, so to speak. And then they progressed right. from, from the stick uh, to the blade. And it just became seemed to come natural that a walking stick would be your natural uh, uh, natural weapon of defense, and I think that that has developed in many societies in that way. Mm-hmm. Yes, totally agree. Now, within the Irish within the Irish uh, system, um, how is that how is that introduced, and, and how do you uh, uh, how's the promotion? How are the levels of progression? Where, where do they come from, and, and how do you develop a uh, an Irish stick fighter, if you will? Um, well, with my dad, I mean, when my dad taught me, he had no set curriculum. I guess you could say it was whatever he felt like teaching me that day. It was just it was very kind of off the cuff. Um, if he saw something that he thought needed work, he'd work on it and then add on to it. Uh, when I teach it now, um, I have uh, because of of the uh, Asian influence uh, of training, mm-hmm. I, I have in my head a set of ideas that I I've, I've, I've kind of set off as okay, I'll teach them this and that will stream, streamline to this, that will roll into this, this will hook up with this. And it's kind of like a little Lego set. I try to connect the connector. Sure. So. Um, um, but if I base it on how my dad taught me, it, again, it was basically a, a salad bar. <laughs> I mean, one day <laughs> I would do one thing, the next day I would do another thing. Um, when I teach now, uh, I've broken it down to what I kind of consider five levels. 
and I have certain a certain amount of techniques for each level, and then you got your barreling, which is uh, um, there's different types of barreling. Barreling is basically free forming, where you just have a bunch of guys come swinging at you and you do your stuff. So um, you kind of have that. So I, I mean, I don't really have it where it's got like a belt system or a grading system that way. Mm-hmm. I do have a level system just simply because most martial arts identify with a level of mm-hmm. some sort, mm-hmm. kind of like mm-hmm. you said, some kind of grading system or some kind of uh, uh, notch mark that they can say, okay, I'm here, I have to get here. Mm-hmm. Um, but in my system, if you want to talk traditionally, no, there was nothing like that. Because again, because it was a family style and it was oral tradition, and my dad was really big on this. Um, like when I learned it, I couldn't talk about it to anybody. And he was very adamant about, you keep this to yourself, this is family. I mean, and that's a whole other story about how I got him to eventually give me permission to teach outside the family. That was a, a war in itself. But um, because it was such an oral-based tradition, uh, you know, that the whole systemizing of it, mm-hmm. I don't think really happened. I don't think it really became like a systemized kind of ranked kind of thing because it's a father-son thing. It's, uh, you know, come on, boy, we're going to do this today, and, and away we go. So now that, you know, I've kind of... Um, been allowed to kind of uh, uh, put it out there for the other martial artists. Now I find that I'm sort of systemizing it to a degree, um, but that's still kind of in the works, <laughs> I guess you could say. Sure. I haven't come, I haven't come with a set uh, thing. I have a few gentlemen, a gentleman in Boston, uh, uh, Rob Masson, who has uh, kind of got what I call a level two kind of uh, credential with me, mm-hmm. been with me a while, mm-hmm. and I just uh, certified uh, about 14 guys a couple of weeks ago um, for a level one. So we're getting that kind of idea now, right. but it's still, like I said, it's still kind of a, a work in progress. Um, but, uh, when I teach somebody, I mean, going back to your original question, cause I'm very long winded as you'll soon learn, um, the footwork and of course the basic stances and whatnot are really worked. Uh, the Irish footwork's not really intricate, but it's sometimes so subtle it, it kind of gets skipped. Like people kind of miss it cause it just seems so, uh, so easy to do. Mm-hmm. But there's a kind of a subtleness to it that I try to make sure I tap into. And that's the big thing. And, of course, getting used to the two hands on the stick. Um, I, th- I think because we have a lot of uh, uh, Filipino stick fighters that com- come over because the, they love anything to do with a stick, so they want to try it. And two hands on the stick sometimes is a little different for them. Sure. And I find uh, – and, and holding it, of course, on a, on a horizontal uh, base is, is something that they have to get used to. So, I mean, that's probably the biggest thing we start with. Uh, and then we get into the, we don't have too many long range systems. This is a closed in system. So, um, you know, you get the long range, the stick punches out of the way first, and then you get into close in, uh, where you get to close in and use what we call the pivotal. And that's a whole other, you know, conversation, but, mm-hmm. uh, and then we get in and then from there it's building on that. So we try to build on that foundation of the footwork to chase the stick, get in there close and then have your heyday. I see. And so, uh, essentially, as you said, this is a close uh, a close quarter system, then. Yes. And, uh, Very much so, yeah. I would, I, would, I would class it as that, only because our job is to get in where we want to be about, you know, a foot away from you, the max. You know what I mean? We want to maximize the two hands, really? uh, the two striking ends. Uh, the middle striking end, you know, the, the middle strike as well. We want to get very, very close, yeah, for headbutts and <laughs> all this stuff. Now, now, is this is this working with the sh- with the uh, with the uh, walking shillelagh, or is this working with like a, a cudgel or both? Uh, no, we work with the, the bata or or the shillelagh. It's a, it depends on your on your height. Mm-hmm. Um, like um, basically, when people come in, they they always ask how long the stick needs to be, and and it's like, well, I base it on your height, so you just take your fist. Um, you put them, you put your knuckles together, bring them up to your chest, and then you measure elbow to elbow, and then you add six inches. So basically, everybody will have kind of a like a really tall guy. His his stick might be like you know 46 inches to 48 inches. Uh, mine is about 38. Um, so it depends. Like again, it depends on the fighter. But it's just the, the simple, the simple shillelagh, the simple long bata with the with the one knob end. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. usually, on average, the average person's about a 40 inch stick usually. I see. Now, do you uh, do you hand make uh, your your shillelagh or, or, uh, or? I have I have a I have a gentleman that makes my uh, my all the stuff for all the guys. He makes replicas for me out of any kind of wood that we want because we beat on the sticks a lot in class. Um, if I had everything made out of traditional blackthorn, mm-hmm. I, you know, I, I'd be taking out a second mortgage <laughs> because uh, it's so expensive and you know the sticks would get beaten up so much. So we have um, most of our sticks are made out of purple heart. Okay. 
Um, it's uh, I don't know if you're familiar with mm-hmm. that kind of wood. Mm-hmm. It's kind of a hard wood. I know a lot of uh, uh, a lot of the Escrima guys have some for power sticks. Um, we have uh, Granandillo, uh, but I have a weapons maker that makes the replicas for everybody. Um, and again, it's it's kind of a preference. Most people go with the Purple Heart because it's probably the most inexpensive wood of all the woods. Um, we have a few that uh, go to the Granandillos and the Jatobas and the Ironwoods and whatnot. Um, but uh, it doesn't affect the 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 applications or the uh, the motions of the style, which is good. Um, and some people try to like put little, make theirs like a little uneven, make them a little knobby to <laughs> represent kind of what a blackthorn look like. It's kind of sure. tough, but most of them are pretty smooth. Mm-hmm, so, mm-hmm. Yeah, so we have a guy that makes them for us. But they all have the uh, the root at the at the top. Yeah, yeah, they all have the knob end. Yes. Okay. Okay. Interesting. So uh, you had mentioned that uh, at, at an early age that um, I, I and I have to assume that around 15 or 16, uh, you had said that you had stopped due to your father's passing. I'm very sorry to hear you lost your father at a young age. Uh, but oh, no, no, actually, no, no. I lost no? my father in 1998. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Yeah. Uh, um, my misunderstanding. No, so, so then, uh, that being said, uh, what yeah. took you away uh, from further developing uh, your stick fighting art as a uh, as a teenager? Um, well, I always kept I always kept practicing it because Dad, you know, still still always had something to teach me. Mm-hmm. But I guess the reason I went into the other arts is I think it's just you know I I guess I was having steak every night. I wanted to go get some chicken. Uh-huh. You know, um, and, and I don't mean that in a, in a, in a, a smart ass way. In no, I understand. Um, I just think I wanted to see what else was out there. I mean, you know, and for the Kung Fu, I mean, my story is no different than most people mm-hmm. that I know that get into Kung Fu. I saw a Bruce Lee movie. I wanted to do what he did. That was, I mean, it sounds corny, but I'm not going to lie. You know, I mean, that's, that's what it was. And I just saw that there were other things out there and I really want to experience them. And, and I mean, I dabbled in the Hapkido's and the Taekwondo's mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. and I searched around and, and uh, the Aikido's and whatnot. And then when um, I, I found uh, the old style Kung Fu that, uh, that was being taught in Toronto's Chinatown, I just, there was something about it that I really liked. And, and when I, when I did it, you know, my dad was fine with it. And he said, if you're going to do this, you, you, know, you do it. You don't just do it half assed He was never about that. So, um, he was very supportive. Uh, I still kept up my training with, with the, with the, uh, with the batter, with the, with the shillelagh. I mm-hmm. still kept that up. So that placated him and made sure that he didn't think that it was getting kind of swept under the carpet. Mm-hmm. But I did throw myself really into the Asian art, Asian arts. And because, um, they are so, well, quote unquote, systemized, um, I really kind of liked it because you, you knew what you had learned or where you were, what you were going to learn. Mm-hmm. It was like this whole kind of nicely organized, um, uh, system that, you know, you could see where you stood, where you used to stand, where you're going to stand. Where, like I said, when I, anything I learned from my dad, you know, I loved it, but it was just like what he felt like teaching that day. You know what I mean? So sure. it was kind of like, it was this really nice breath of fresh air because it was like, I mean, and don't get me wrong, once I got uh, into the Asian styles, I could see my dad did have a, a, a kind of a system. He just didn't realize he did. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like I could tell by uh, when I started getting into the Asian arts, I was like, oh, that's why dad taught me this way. Because he wanted me to get to that. Okay. But when you're a kid, it just like seems like this just big bundle, bundle of goo kind of plop, plopped on your lap, right? Sure, sure. So, um, so I, think, I think I fell in love with that part of the Asian arts just because of the way they, they systemize. And then when I had my first experience with uh, La Punta Arnista Abanico, which was Filipino stick fighting, it was very interesting because I was really excited because it was a stick, and I was like, hey, I, I, I'm used to stick fighting. That's great. But it was then so different, and yet there were so many similarities that it was really um, exciting to me. Sure. Because I, I was like, there were these two countries so far apart, the Philippines and Ireland, yet there was you know, some things that were almost identical, but then some things were so different. And it was so hard for me to stay out when I learned the Filipino systems that anything I had trouble with, I, I, I just became obsessed with, like I had to, I had to overcome it. You know what I mean? So sure. I think that's, that might be why I jumped into the Asian art so much because there was so much to kind of overcome, like from what I'd been used to. And I, I just kind of jumped in both feet, you know? So with the, with those two si- systems separately within the, uh, within the uh, Screamer or the Kali system and within the Gung Fu, uh, what, to what uh, level of progression had you made it in your, in your studies? 
Um, well, I, I became, uh, for, the, for the Gong Fu, um, my, my Sifu, Sifu Lord Ging Hong, uh, I reached Sifu status in and around just before 1990. Mm-hmm. Um, and I started teaching at his club uh, in, in Chinatown, and I taught there until he passed away, which was just a few years ago. Um, but he was, you know, he lived to be the right old age of like 96. So he, was, wow. he had, he had a, he had a good run. Um, so, uh, for the, for the, uh, for the La Punte there, Arnis Navanuco, um, that was kind of an offshoot because the gentleman, uh, Dr. Joe Petlaria, who was the instructor for, for the Arnis, he was, um, a very good friend of, of Sifu Lors. So when he taught me, it wasn't really part of the curriculum of the club. He just came in and, and on, sa- on Saturdays and Sundays, um, we would just do our niece just because um, uh, he was originally from the Philippines and he was teaching it at his club and mm-hmm. he kind of did it as a favor to my Sifu to teach it to me. Sure. So it wasn't, so I got no ranking in the La Punta. I got mm. like a no official ranking or anything like that. I studied with uh, I, uh, Dr. Joe um, probably, I'd say about six years, you know, like, you know, a lot, not like every day. Like I'd see him once a week, twice a week. Mm-hmm. Um, but um yeah, the, the only ranking I, I can officially say that I have is the Sifu ranking in the in the Hungar system. So now, how does the how does that influence um, both the the the, um, the Filipino stick fighting as well as the um, the Hungar kung fu? How does that influence your your method of uh, of teaching um, the uh, the Irish stick? Oh, well, it really, really, like I said, it really helped me kind of systemize what needed to be taught first and then what needed to be taught like next and, and how to progress a person from A to B to C to D. Mm-hmm. Um, I find that that was probably the biggest uh, assistance for that was um, the Asian arts, uh, both the Filipino system and, and the, the Chinese system was about how to, how to block out certain lessons. And what, you know, you had to have a, a, to, to set up your goals and what you wanted somebody to learn for the sure. day or for the week or for the month. Mm-hmm. Um, that and the way you explain things. Um, my dad's way of teaching was stick in hand and it was very uh, just, you know, hands on, like come at me, wham, wham, wham. Oh, sorry, you got a bump on your head, blah, blah, blah. Um, so the, 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 the narrative um, wasn't so, I mean, my dad wasn't really big on the narrative of it. And I found that when I have to teach Irish now, um, and as you can tell from this interview, I have no problem talking. And it was really from the Chinese system that I learned to really kind of get a narrative involved in the applica- uh, in the technical explanations, mm-hmm. which I think really helped me for when I started to teach, when I finally got permission to teach uh, to non-Doyles. Um, I think that really helps because a lot of people, they need that kind of... Um, that narrative to explain why you're doing it, what you're doing it for, um, the reason for, for where, where it came from, why I got this name, where, you know, my dad, unless I asked, he didn't really ex- extrapolate on it. He didn't expand on anything. It was all about getting the, the physical technique down. So um, I find the Asian arts really kind of brought that out where you had to really kind of, you wanted to explain it on not just a physical application level, but you want to explain it on a verbal level. So people really, you can look in their eyes and see if they got it, if they understood it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, and then sure. I think that would translate into their physical application a lot more. So, I mean, that would probably be the biggest influence for me uh, that way. Um, and also the footwork, the, 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 the Asian footwork, um, I really liked it. So uh, it gave me a sense of I can switch um, – from the Chinese footwork to the Irish footwork, like I switch back and forth uh, when I teach. Okay. Um, but if someone comes in and they say, you know, I want to work, learn the traditional Irish uh, footwork, I want to learn like the, the shillelagh, like how it was taught to you, then I'll do it. But then I find if some people are having problems, uh, I can slip in a little Chinese footwork in there and kind of help them, mm-hmm. kind of maybe overcome like a, a, an issue they're having. So um, in that regard, it helps the style so that the Asian systems could technically, you could say that they're helping the, the, the Irish system because if there's somebody that can't get a movement or they're just having real problems and I slip a little uh, Chinese footwork in there and they get it because maybe they have a Chinese background originally or some other style, sure. uh, if they get the technique, I'm happy. I'm not one of those ones that say, oh, no, that's not pure and, and whatnot. I mean, I like to make sure that they are comfortable because I treat everyone if I can as individually as I possibly can. So I don't want like a bunch of robots sitting in class doing robotic movement. Sure. I want it to be alive. And um, so going again, going back to your original question, I think the Asian arts give me that, that uh, um, 
what you call it, variety or, or, or at least freedom of variety. If I have to slip something in to help the Irish move forward, I can. So. Understood. Understood. Very interesting. Now, being that uh, being that the Irish art, the Irish stick fighting art, is a, uh, a close quarter system, as you described, um, is it circular in, in, in movement, or, or is it uh, more angular in, in striking movement? Uh, it's both, actually. Um, there are certain things what we call thrashing, um, and a lot of uh, uh, what we call crescent moon and cross hits, which are very circular. Uh, you you kind of you kind of treat the spine <laughs> like a uh, like a swivel, and you, when you when you're in a certain position, and the, and then the whole body locks with stick in hand, and you torque the whole body around in this big circular sweep. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's circular motions there, but there are angular attacks too, especially when you get in close and you come up to like the floating rib, and you hit with one end with the floating, and then you cross down immediately with the other side to come down on either the shoulder or the chin or the side of the head. Sure. Um, so so it has both. Um, and I think it's probably pretty even. I don't think it favors one or the other. Mm-hmm. Um, there's surprisingly a lot of circular uh, um, strikes in the, in the style. You wouldn't think so, uh, you know, if you, if you, you know, kind of read the description of it. But mm-hmm. uh, once you get in close, you know, the circle is, is, is much more your friend than a linear line, right? But, right. Uh, th- but there's, there's definitely both in it. And I find that um, a lot of the guys gra- gravitate towards the circular techniques. They seem a little more natural. Um, and again, I think a lot of it is just because they're not so used to getting in so close when they have such a long weapon in their hands. Sure, sure, absolutely. They, like, I want to keep them out there. I got this long weapon, right? So, which, like I said, for me was so hard when I was learning the Filipino uh, stick fighting when I was going mm-hmm. the Arnie's, I kept charging in and and uh, I, Dr. Joe, uh, the instructor, would be like, "What are you doing? <laughs> Keep them off, you know, the last eight inches of your stick, whack, 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 right?" Mm-hmm. So for me, it was so hard to stay outside. And for a lot of these guys, it, it, they find it because they have such a long stick in their hand, they want to keep people kind of at arm's length. And I'm saying, no, you got to get in closer, getting closer. So it's kind of interesting to to watch actually. Now, with the uh, with your particular system, are there uh, are there uh, empty hand variations or empty hand techniques that you combine? Uh, should you happen to lose your stick? Yeah, oh yeah, definitely. Um, there's some regrabs and whatnot, but you also we have a lot of techniques where you actually punch uh, or strike um, while you're, you, the stick's in play. Hmm. Meaning, like I could co- I could come in and be close and still have two hands on my stick, mm-hmm. but all of a sudden I'll just fire my hip, fire my shoulder, and you get a left cross. Hmm. Like with a fist, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Like there was mm-hmm. punching. Um, there's a lot of techniques with that. There's also, uh, like I said, you come in close, all of a sudden, you know, you get the barnacle kiss or a headbutt. Sure. Drives right in, drives right in. So there are a lot of um, non-stick strikes that even though you, uh, you might not have been disarmed, you might not have lost your stick. Mm-hmm. But there are some strikes. But, yes, if you do lose your stick, obviously we have a few, um, and we try to get the opponent's stick off them. <laughs> so, of course, of course. Now, do you have uh, similar to, like, say, the uh, Filipino styles, which you which you're somewhat familiar with, as well as uh, as some of the uh, um, Japanese or Chinese systems? Uh, they utilize their their weapons in some cases in uh, in disarming or in trapping, so to speak, and allowing mm-hmm. uh, allowing you to to lock someone up and uh, and well, right. with the trapping. Uh, does that does the uh, Irish system lend to that at all? Very, very minimally. Uh, mm-hmm. We have a couple of disarms, and really uh, with the disarms, it is, uh, you know, try to get them to lose their stick, but you're still in a position to strike. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the locking up, there's, like, very few. And the only reason for that, and I remember when I talked to my dad about this, because uh, I would go back. Anytime I learned any of the Arnie's, I'd run back to my dad and say, look at how they do this, and look at how they do that. Right. And I would say, hey, how come we don't have this? And dad mm-hmm. would say, because you got to remember – where this style was born or where this style comes from. And, it, and, and it, you know, he would never denigrate or take away from any other system. Mm-hmm. He, he loved everything. Mm-hmm. But the faction fights, you know, they were just huge brawls. And if you took too long of a time, if you had too much time with one person and you locked them up, mm-hmm. you were also locked up. And you don't know if their cousin's coming up from behind just to whack you in the back of the head with his. So you didn't want to lock yourself up or get um, uh, your stick kind of in the position where it was no longer used or you couldn't kind of free it. Like if you were, if you were trying to disarm someone and you're both kind of in this little power struggle for that couple of seconds, sure, it, it, it could lead to someone from behind just whacking you that, you know, they may have finished their first, they might have finished their guy off 
and they're free and they see that, you know, you're locking up their, their nephew or something and all of a sudden, wham. So, uh, like, again, according to my dad, it was the reason our style doesn't have that is you wanted to, you know, smash, move on to the next guy. Um, you didn't want to get into any kind of grappling or wrestling match if you could avoid it simply because there were so many people around, so many potential enemies. You want to make sure you kept yourself kind of ready to go uh, to hit, you know, closest target to you. So, um, though there are a couple of quick releases and a couple of quick disarms, very rare in our system. Very, very rare. So, in, in reality, then uh, the the system, as you say, developed from the uh, from the faction fights more than anything else. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's it's I think it's a lot of evolution mm-hmm. in that. Like uh, um, same with the Filipino arts. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, evolution in the fact that it was born of a time that if you did something wrong, you probably didn't teach it because you probably weren't around. <laughs> right. Or you know, you were so crippled up from doing the technique wrong that that technique probably didn't get passed on. Sure. So sure. Um, through through that kind of evolution and and survival of the fittest and and that kind of thing. I, I think any any kind of fighting system that's born of that era, you know, the bad techniques kind of get filtered out, um, and and you, you're left with what you have. So I guess within the fashion fights and within my family, they figured, you know, um, forget the disarms and the, and the and the and the you know the grappling locks right, because right. you don't have the time. So it wasn't infused into the style as much. So I mean, again. I'm no historian, and I'll never claim to be, but, I mean, I'm going from by what I was taught and how I kind of look at the, the martial world now. So. Sure, sure. So uh, tell me a little bit, uh, give me a little bit of background or history on the faction fights. What was that all about? Um, well, faction fights were a lot of times it was family against family or town against town, sometimes county against county. Um, and it was just a way to settle disputes. Um, and that's, I mean, <laughs> I wish I could be more po- poetic <laughs> or mm-hmm. mosaic about it, but mm-hmm. that's basically what it was. The disagreement was uh, was uh, pending, and uh, it was settled with a stick, you know, and the two families got together and just wham, or the two counties, or the two <laughs> towns sent people, and, and, and it was just, you know, out in the out in the fields they'd meet. And uh, I have a gentleman, um, he's a woodworker, I was going to go to him to get me a weapons rack, he's from Ireland, mm-hmm. and he's got to be pushing 90 now but he he when i first met him i said yeah I'm, i want to get a thing and he goes oh you have some shillelaghs like yeah i teach irish stick fighting and he was just blown away that it was out there that uh-huh. somebody was teaching it because sure. so but he he was telling me um stories about how him him and his dad used to to go and watch a few of them and because they'd take place at night they used to follow the the, the stone wall uh fences home because uh-huh. you couldn't really see much right. on the way home so it was kind of neat because you know we got to hear that and uh, and it was it was a nice thing because it kind of took me back to someone else who had kind of experienced it, not just hearing from my dad, right? So that right. was kind of a very neat thing. Sure, sure, absolutely. Now, from what I understand, uh, uh, the uh, the stick makers or or the uh, the shillelagh makers at times would load the root. Is that true? Uh, yes, I mean my dad never did, and and everything. But from what I I can understand from a lot of history books and and John Hurley when I was talking to him, um, there is there is a, a, a lot of uh, evidence that that did happen. Yeah, yeah. Interesting, interesting. So that uh, they would actually drill uh, into the root, and they would pour some sort of molten, uh, uh, yeah, whatever. Sort of, yeah. Uh, like a, yeah, lead barrel. Like get, get a lead mm-hmm. barrel in there mm-hmm. and, and mm-hmm. just get for a little more impact, you know. <laughs> or you take a, <laughs> or you, you know, you take a whip and cut off the whip and just have about uh, the whip handle and about eight inches, and then tie a little uh, piece of lead on the end of it. Uh huh. Uh huh. And just like for a whipping kind of, and that would give you a good whack. Um, but yeah, they did that. Some of them would sharpen the one of the end of the sticks. Used to have, you know, where the you would have sort of a point esque kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, wasn't really common to uh to anything my dad ever made reference to but right. um but uh, i know that some guys used to do that so so there were those that really uh, were a little bit unfair in, in their practice so to speak well, when they would come you know, out to the faction fight yeah yeah i mean there was a there was like a, a set of ideals that you tried to adhere to mm-hmm. but all in all you know, the, the guy standing across from you wants to smash your skull in. You're not going to let him. And, and you know, if you if you you know feel that you did something bad by point pointing taking your stick and making it a little pointier than his, yeah. uh, at the end of the day, you're the one at home. 
you know, with the family. Right, <laughs> right, right, so right. I think and, the end right. justifies the means there. Right? Sure, sure, <laughs> sure. So these were some of the, uh, these were really, um, the faction fights were taken quite seriously then. Oh, very much so. Very much so, yeah. They, um, like I said, they, they, you know, it, it, it's funny because the, the Irish, uh, it's kind of like a part, they kind of want to forget though, because, it, it, you know, they don't, they, they, they're, they're trying to, I guess, the, the image of, of, they're trying to break that image of, you know, uh, you know, the drunken Patty and, and sure, all that kind of stuff. Sure. So that, 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 that era, the fighting faction era is, is really kind of not talked about too, too much. Mm-hmm. It's coming out a bit more now and, and that's because of things like the internet and whatnot. But I remember um, when, uh, I remember John Hurley uh, was doing research and he talked to the Irish uh, tourism board and he and he wanted to get some information on this and they they were like well we don't talk about that stuff and they were very very adamant about not talking about it and not helping them out to get any research mm-hmm. they want mm-hmm. kind of want that that go that kind of section of history to kind of disappear sure um just because they were pretty they were pretty brutal i mean the faction fights you know were brutal i mean there's that one quote quote from uh one gentleman's book saying you know well your son died but we won you know and it's it's kind of like that was <laughs> the sentence that kind of summed it up, you know, I mean, people did die in these things and, you know, they were pretty bloody. So Mm -hmm. I guess there's a sadness to it that uh, I think a lot of the, um, the, the new kind of image of the Irish, they want to kind of step away from it. Right. But at the same time, you know, it's heritage, right? It's what makes your, your history rich. And, and I mean, it might not always be picturesque and beautiful, but kind of it's the, it's the reality. Sure. And, you know, if you can learn to embrace it for the positive, then I don't think it's a bad thing. Exactly. And I, I think, and I mean, I'm grateful that, I mean, I thank, you know, the, the stars every night that, you know, my dad, you know, learned from my granddad and, 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 and made me learn. I mean, like I said, when I was young, I don't really think I appreciated it in the scope, but now it's like, I wish I had him back and to, I could have 20,000 more lessons from him, you know, right. of Just course. because, you know, now I look at it and go, wow. Uh, what was I given? Wow, I, I'm so lucky, you know. And and you know, that's that, that's the kind of thing I think the Irish, as a whole, they'll look on it eventually like that. I mean, the faction fights are, there are they are history, and it is it is what kind of built the nation. So you know, you kind of you shouldn't walk away from it or, or turn your back on it because take the good from it. You don't have to take the bad, you know. So that's what I'm thinking. Agreed, agreed. I understand completely. Now. Um... When we speak about that and speak about the history of it, I'm sure, uh, as well as uh, as with the uh, advent of the internet and everyone being able to do their research on faction fights, some of that had influence uh, upon the uh, immigration to the U.S. Obviously, with uh, a situation such as the Gangs of New York or the movie that was made and, and the history that was played out there in right. similar fashion. Right. In in Canada, there in Newfoundland, did did, did the same or, or similar experiences uh, carry on? Oh yes, they did. I mean, um, there's there were there were a number of factions that that were in the Newfoundland area. Um, uh, the, uh, the 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 clans that came from like County Wexford and County Wicklow and mm-hmm. County Tipperary, um, they all kind of hung together and they had little factions um, and uh, the. Uh, there was one group called, um, it was funny, it's called, they were called the Yellow Bellies. Uh-huh. And a lot of times you say that, it's like, oh, you know, you think Yellow Belly, you think like sure. a, a, a coward or whatever. But actually, it was the color of their um, shirts, their sport teams wore for the hurling game, they uh-huh. had the yellow stripe. Uh-huh. So and I believe they were from Wexford. And anyway, uh, in St. John's, Newfoundland, which is the, the capital of Newfoundland, um, there's this corner where there was this huge brouhaha faction fight where a lot of um, bodies, the next day had washed up on shore mm. from the fight, like that mm-hmm. they were dead bodies. And that corner is actually called Yellow Belly Corner to this day. Um, uh, that's where I guess the bodies washed up, and that's on Water Street in St. John's, Newfoundland. So, yes, it did carry over. Um, now, Canada is probably um, a little, still a little more uh, uh, British-oriented, Okay. Um, and the Irish are in, in Newfoundland, but um, like my dad used to always say, the, the um, um, United States got the Irish and Canada got the Scottish. When you talk about <laughs> kind of the Celtic thing, uh-huh. because there's a lot of the the the, the Scottish um, influence in Canada is a lot probably a lot predominant, except for in Newfoundland, but in like Nova Scotia um, and New Brunswick and those areas mm-hmm. in the Maritime, mm-hmm. um, they still speak Scottish Gaelic there. Um, 
There's not so much Irish Gaelic. You can't really find it. A lot of Scottish stuff, a lot of Highland game mm-hmm. and that kind of thing. So um, where we flew, our family's from in Newfoundland, though, it's still, like I said, very Irish. And a lot of the traditions, including, you know, the, the, the faction sticking together, get, did come over there and they, they established themselves and, and uh, um, you know, kind of carried the, the traditions the same way. Like if there was a disagreement, <laughs> everybody got together. Um, and there's uh, a lot of... Um, you can look it up in some of the Newfoundland libraries where they talk about, you know, the yellow bellies and the other, and the other factions that, you know, did have uh, a couple of bloody battles. So it did carry over uh, very much so. From a, from, from a perspective of a gentleman of today's time and, and today's world, uh, how do you feel that, um, that the Irish stick fighting uh, can assist uh, a student, uh, a, uh, a novice on the street, uh, and, and, uh, and what type of impact do you think socially uh, this type of system may have? Wow. Um, well, I mean, the one thing I love about all stick fighting, mm-hmm. and that's Philippine included, uh, and Yoga de Pau, and all of them, is I don't know, and if anybody studies stick fighting, they'll know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, but I love the, 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 the impact you can get you can't get away from it when you learn stick fighting. Mm-hmm. You can't get away from it. There's an impact there. There's something coming at you. Your eyes have to stay open. They have to you know they have to see everything. And a lot of my students will agree is you know once you do like an hour of stick fighting and you got these sticks coming at you wham 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 wham, your whole sense changes. And then you switch and you switch to empty hand and you stand across from somebody and they throw a punch. Well, that punch seems like molasses after an hour of sticks coming at you. Um, so that sense of, uh, and I'm not going to say immortal sense because it doesn't give you that, but sure. there's, there's, there's a, there's a, there's a, a confidence that gets built when you work with weapons. And I think for, like you said, the practitioner that mm-hmm. learns the stick fighting, I think it gives them that confidence because, you know, they are dealing with a, a, a foreign object coming at them, which if it's not done properly can do a lot of damage. Uh, they learn more about uh, the weaknesses of the human body. I mean, every martial art does that, but when you have a weapon in your hand, you get that, there's a sense to you, right? You're mm-hmm. a different sure. person mm-hmm. than when you're standing with your hands empty. And so I think that that whole confidence and the way they see movement um, will, will help them. Um, and then with the social kind of, your, your, you know, your social question is, well, unless they, you know, um, ban sticks, <laughs> right? you know, um, you're always going to have a sense of, or you're, not, you're always going to have a chance to to um, have access to something. If you have training in a stick, uh, whether it be Irish, Filipino, any any system, um, any object in your hand, once you learn stick fighting, any object in your hand becomes potential. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, and that, that I mean, you know, there might be people who disagree with me, and there might be people who agree with me. That's their choice. But I really find that you get that sense of yourself. Uh, and your, your, your spatial awareness, your technical awareness, your, your, your quick, you know, most damage you can possibly do awareness as opposed to simply, you know, defending yourself and getting the hell out of there. You'll have all these choices blocked in. And I find when you weren't with any stick or any weapon, that becomes a little more apparent. And I don't know if I'm making any sense because I do to me, but sometimes I don't to everybody else. <laughs> so, um, but I find that, uh, you know, people are always going to have that sense of they're walking down the street with their umbrella or they're walking down the street with their cane. Mm-hmm. They're, mm-hmm. they're, they're going to have that sense of at least I have something. And, and, you know, heaven forbid it happens, but if someone comes out of the shadows, you know, there's that confidence there. Um, and I think that's what all martial arts aspire to do. But with stuff like stick fighting, I think it, it gives that little extra because you don't have to be a strong hulking guy to, you know, to do some damage. I mean, I mean, I know in any martial art, you don't have to be a strong looking guy to do some damage, but with a stick, you know, you, you get clipped by a stick, it hurts. <laughs> you know what I mean? Absolutely. Um, and I think that that sense of, of what people can do with their own physical techniques once they, once they learn them, uh, I think it gives them that real confidence to kind of, you know, I mean, if they come to learn because they are afraid to go out or whatnot, it'll give them that sense to maybe get out there and, and enjoy life and not be stuck in the house because they're afraid to kind of experience Right, the outside, right. You know, um, sure. Again, you know, I don't know if I answered your question. I hope I did, but you know, I have absolutely. To no, 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 no. Ab- absolutely, absolutely, absolutely did. <laughs> not a problem. Not a problem. 
Now, one question, that, uh, one particular question that I wanted to touch on that I that I had forgotten about earlier, uh, in, in the uh, different variations of the single stick fighting as opposed or single hand stick fighting as opposed to the double hand stick, stick fighting, mm -hmm. uh, in, in approach, the double hand stick fighting is a uh, a close quarter art as you indicated. The the single yep. stick fighting is not. Um, single hand, I, up, I, sorry. No, they, they, uh, the single the single hand they will like I. I I know they will when they get in close. I guess if there's a, a block and whatnot, they will use their their uh, free hand to grab. Mm -hmm. um, but basically, they want to keep you out at you know the the for the last ten inches of the stick, right? For full right. velocity. Sure. So they're trying to, to to kind of to keep you out there. They don't have a lot of uh, closing stuff. If they do, it becomes like a kind of like a bayonet thrust mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. or, or something like that. So sure. they will, they, they do have techniques where they will put two hands on the stick. I'm not, I don't want to mislead people thinking that they only put one hand on the stick, but um, the most of their, most of their strikes are with the single hand and they're trying to, again, keep you at uh, at stick length to get those strikes in. So from um, your, per, from your particular perspective, and from where you are at now in your teaching, your teaching modality and so forth, where do you see your particular system developing and, and where do you see it several years down the road as well as yourself? And do you plan to make uh, uh, adjustments to the present system that you teach or are you going to strictly teach it as a, as a traditional art as your father taught it? Wow. Um, okay, well, where do I see it in a couple of years? Um, the interest is probably, let's say, um, I start, I got finally, I finally got like full permission from my dad in like just before he died in 1998. So the, can you say, from, I'm sorry, Mr. Doyle, can you, yep, can you stop okay. there for just a moment and, and tell me how that came about? Because you had touched on it briefly a little bit earlier and I'd like to, I, I'm glad you actually brought that up because I wanted to go back to that. So if we could hear a little oh. bit about how that discussion came about. Oh yeah. Okay. Well, I, I got into a lot of trouble back in 1995 when I was doing an inside Kung Fu interview um, because I had just done the opening ceremonies for the world Wushu championships in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was the first time it was the world Wushu championships were held outside Asia mm -hmm. and the United States got it. It was a really big deal. Right. Um, anyway, um, I have a student in Gong Fu, which, um, some people might know but not, but he was at that time, he was very, very famous with Elvis Stoico. He's a, a, a figure skating Olympian. Yes. Um, and, uh, so anyway, but he's, he was a big time martial arts aficionado and, and he'd been my student since 89. Anyway, we were asked to come and do the opening ceremonies. Um, and I'm not going to go into a long thing. I don't want to waste your time. But anyway, I did an interview with the Mr. Herb Borkland for Inside Country Magazine. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about stuff and, and they asked about my martial background. I said, my dad was my first instructor, blah, blah, blah. And then not thinking, I said, yeah. And then he taught me, you know, Irish dick fighting style, blah, blah, blah. And so they put that in the article, and it was a, it was just a small little one sentence mention. And my dad, I thought he was going to crucify me, right? Because I wasn't supposed to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And like I said, I, I, I mean, to, to, for the listeners to understand, when I would finish a lesson with my dad, I couldn't even talk to my mom about it. Like that's how strict he was. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't know if that's really driven. So anyway, um, when when that came out, we had a real, um, you know, meeting of the minds, so to say. And I said, Dad, I want to teach this to other people. I came out. And, I, and the reason I, I thought this way was um, my instructor in Kung Fu, Sifu Lor, caught a lot of heat back in the 60s when he started teaching non-Chinese. Sure. Um, and, uh, and I said to my dad, I go, you know what, if Sifu Lor decided that it's only for Chinese, I would never learn this rich stuff that I've learned. I've never would have shared, you know, the Chinese culture. I wouldn't know nothing about China. It's like, it's, it, you know, it's such a rich life that I have because I've been able to travel around the world doing this stuff. But if he had that sense of, no, you're not Chinese, you don't learn it. I never would have had exposure to this. And I said, you know what, dad, I think it's the same way. I'm an only, I was like, I was my father's only child, right? He didn't, ha I didn't have, I don't have any brothers or sisters. Mm -hmm. So I said to dad, I said to my dad, I go, dad, if I walk down the street tomorrow and get killed by a car, this style's finished. It's lost forever. Right. Because I'm the only one that's doing it. And he was like, nope, 
no, no. If you're not a door, you don't learn it. <laughs> you know, and so that was in 95. So 95, 96, 97, I kept trying. I kept trying. I kept trying. And, and, and he was just, no. You know, if they don't have the surname Doyle, they won't. They, it's a sacred thing, and they won't respect it. They won't, they won't honor it. They'll just use it for their own gains. They'll start trying to make money off it. And, you know, he was that kind of – that was his thinking, right? It was going to be manipulated into this thing, and, and everybody's going to try to get rich off it, and it's going to just bastardize the name, the family sure. name. That was his sure. worry. So anyway, finally, I mean, he got diagnosed with, with cancer, um, metastatic colon cancer, uh, and that was in uh, that was uh, March March 9th, mm -hmm. and um, I had to fly to Newfoundland, and I sat with him, and we talked, and we had a, a final talk, and it was the final talk, because I mean, that was the talk before he went on the the morphine where he can no longer talk because he's in so much pain. Mm -hmm. And it was the final father-son talk. And I said, Dad, I can't teach this unless you say I can. Uh, I'm asking one last time as your son. <laughs> just let me share this with the world because I, I, I got to teach it to somebody. I don't want it to, 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 to die. I just, it'll be my way of honoring you. Because like I said to my dad, I said 90% of my memories with my father were when he was teaching me stick fighting. Because he was an iron worker, he was a rigger, he was away a lot working. Uh -huh. So the only times I really saw him was when he was training me. Um, and then when I went to you know, uh, university and, and, and college and stuff, I didn't see him much either. So 90% sure. of my memories of my dad are with stick in hand. Mm -hmm. And I said, Dad, this will help me remember you. If I can start passing it on every time I pick up a stick to teach somebody, you're going to be on my shoulder. Give me that gift, please. Right? And finally... You know, almost literally on his deathbed, he said, "Okay, go ahead." Right. So that was that was the that was the story of how I finally got his permission. Because I wouldn't have done it if he said no. I would have had to honor that. You know, and you and I wouldn't be talking right now. <laughs> um, but that uh, that was the story, and then and then from there it uh, it uh, it took off. I mean, it was very slow to take off. I'll be really honest with you. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there was some interest. Um, most interest was from people down in the U.S., uh, mm -hmm. mostly Boston and Philadelphia. Sure. Um, most of my detractors or or people who were totally disgusted and, and thought it was ridiculous were mostly people from Ireland, surprisingly enough. Um, I used to get a lot of hate mail. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Wow. Uh, um, and then I'd say in around 2004, 2005, the interest really started to pick up, and then everything exploded when I listened to one of my students, um, and they said, because uh, I had a website and everything, but, you know, with pictures, you can't see movement, right? Of course, you of course. See pictures. So they are saying, you've got to put something on this thing called YouTube, mm. and I'm like, all right, <laughs> I'll put something on YouTube, and it, I put uh, just some various clips on YouTube, and once that happened, within two months, it was... I was getting unbelievable amounts of emails, like just insane uh, for people that were interested. And, and, and so I put like five little lessons up on YouTube um, and like just little, little, little class clip it sure. so that uh, people can, can get the basics of the system just if they want to try it at home to see if they like it. But um, it, it exploded after the YouTube exposure. And then now it's, it's getting to the point now where it's, uh, <clears throat> people aren't uh, looking at me strange and going, Irish stick fighting, what's that? So, <laughs> I still get that, but not as much now. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that 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 is a good thing. That is definitely yeah. a good thing. So yeah. uh, again, ba back to uh, back to the question uh, that I had originally asked. I, I believe mm -hmm. um, in, in regards to in regards to your uh, your method, your modality of teaching, uh, mm -hmm. and. Um, the, the future of the the art of itself. Do you plan to retain uh, the traditional way that your father taught it and, and teach it in that way, or are, will there be adjustments along the way that you may little intricacies that, that you may incorporate into your teaching uh, modalities that, that you may mm -hmm. decide might be part of your format, as it were, in progress yeah. in progressing the system. Yeah, I think it's going to be a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. I think it'll be column A and column B. I think I will always have the pure traditional that my dad taught me mm -hmm. un unchanged from what granddad taught him to what great granddad taught grand. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Sure. It will be that. Um, and that is, I think, 
<clears throat> a kind of a personal thing for me that comes from the heart. Of course. But everything has to evolve. And, and I think that um, the future of the system, I think we'll, there, there might be little changes here and there um, because you need, uh, like even my dad said, every generation has added to the system, right? Like my dad added a technique that he learned, uh, that he came up with um, when he, because he was on the front lines in Korea uh, and during the Korean War. Um, mm -hmm. And a couple of times, the, the, the stick fighting that granddad had taught him, and when he did this, when he had his hand-to-hand -hand things, it saved his life. And he learned a couple of things, and he and he and he added a couple of techniques um, into the system that he thought worked when it saved his life over in, in Korea. Sure. So, so he himself said every generation adds something to it. So, mm -hmm. I don't think he's going to look down from heaven and get pissed off because it's an evolutionary thing. So, yeah, I think there will be a progression. Something will. Um, I, I think this, I'm hoping <laughs> that the style will evolve into something uh, even more complete mm -hmm. um, because, you know, every style has an inherent weakness, right? Of Everything course. does. And, and I mean, with, with our stuff, people had to say, you know, what would be the weakness? I said, well, our long range techniques, we don't have a lot. We're a closing system. We like to close in as quickly as we possibly can, and then we go to work. So um, there might be something down the road where I, can, I might try to develop more long range. Um, so I think, yeah, I think definitely that that would be kind of the future look. But I will always have what I'll call the old style or the pure style for those people that want to learn that because you do get those people who are like, no, I want to do what they did in the 1800s. Of like, course. Like they're really uh -huh. adamant. Mm -hmm. So I will have that. But I think, yeah, I, I think there will be a progression. I think it has to because if, if you're not uh, trying to, to evolve it, um, you know, you're, you're going to miss something or something's going to get left out or something's going to get, you know, you're going to lose opportunity for something, and you want to you want to kind of keep that boulder moving. You want to keep it rolling. You don't want to stop it and then have to kind of pry it up and start getting it rolling again. So, Absolutely. Um, yeah, Absolutely. I, I I can see that, and and that's I think probably why um, I, I I dabbled in all the other styles too, mm -hmm. um, especially the Filipino stick arts. I love them because I just like the the, the fluidity and I like the motion and I like the applications and I like the attitude. Of the, of the Filipino system. So I, I can see kind of a hybrid thing kind of working its way maybe somewhere down the road. Mm -hmm. um, but the only reason I haven't done that as yet is because, um, A, I want to keep my memories of my dad kind of pure right now. So I'm sure. a little bit of a control freak on that. I'll be, I'll be really honest. I really am. I'm a little guarded. <laughs> but also, I want to get it established as the Irish system first because if I hybrided it now, people would be like, well, it's just a Filipino system with an Irish stick. Sure. And I want to make sure that never happened because, mm -hmm. you know, again, it's sacred to me. Um, this is kind of a personal thing between me and my father. So that sacredness has kind of kept me from really, you know, like that's why I don't have instructional DVDs. Like people are like, why don't you have instructional DVDs? I'm too guarded with the system right now. It's just too, it's still too sacred, you know. And for me, even to get 14 guys in a couple of weeks ago and to certify them for level one, and they were not members of my club. They were from different clubs. Some were from down in the States and some were here in Canada. Mm -hmm. That No one understands. That was such a huge, big deal for me because it's like I'm letting go a little bit of control, right? Sure. Um, and, and, and I think that's why. Uh, so the, the pedigree of the style, I'm still so guarded about. But I, I, I mean, for the style to, to live and grow, I have to learn to let that go. But I'm still trying to keep that quality. I'm, I'm in the quality control right now. But once I can get to the point where I'm comfortable, I think then the evolution of style will really take take off because I'll be, I'll have relaxed my kind of grip on it, and and you know the the sacred dad part of it, the traditional old style will be on one side of Glen, and then hopefully the the evolution and the, and the kind of the you know new world shillelagh will be a, a, the evolving one on the other side. Understood. That's what I'm hoping for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and uh, I really really have to thank you for for letting us uh, share that uh, that touching story about how you uh, finally got permission from your father uh, on uh, on the ability to teach. I, I personally appreciate that uh, on a personal level. I I um I want our listeners to be able to uh, uh, get in touch with you. What, what, what is the best way to learn more about your particular system, about you as an instructor? And, and if anyone has any personal questions that they would like to ask you, do you have website? Do you have uh, uh, email um, yeah. address and that kind of thing for, for contact sure. information? Yeah, any, anybody can contact me. Um, they can email me directly. Mm -hmm. And my, my email is just doyle, D-O-Y-L-E, 
at fightingfaction.com. Fighting Faction is all one word, no, no capitals. Uh, F-I-G-H-T-I-N-G-F-A-C-T-I-O-N um, dot com. And they can write me um, anytime. And that's my personal email. And I try to get back to everybody I can. Um, so if I don't get back to you right away, just please be patient. <laughs> um, and also our, our website's the same. It's uh, fightingfaction.com. Uh, it'll be going under um, uh, a renovation probably in the next couple of months. Uh, just because we got to revamp it, it's it's uh, I'm terrible for uh, kind of updating things. <laughs> so we're going to be we're going to be doing a big construction on it in the next couple of months. Um, but you can read more about that. And if you type in Glenn Doyle Shillelagh or Glenn Doyle Irish Stick Fighting, or even if you only type in my name on YouTube, all five lessons should come up, uh, and a couple of like uh, collage clips should come up. Mm-hmm. But you can you can search that. Um, and if you want to call my club, um, you can call the club. I don't know if you want me to give up a number on this rec- on this interview, but that's uh, that's want, uh, that's fine. That's up to you if you'd like. Uh, yeah, like they, to it's just uh, it's area code nine zero five, and it's two nine nine three nine four nine. So um, I've had people call me, and if they just have questions or anything, I mean, feel free to to give me a call or send me an email, and I will do my utmost to get back to everybody. I try when I can. And we want to. We also want to remind everyone that Mr. Doyle is located in Canada, not in, in not in the United States. Yes, I'm in Ontario, just about 30 minutes outside Toronto. So mm-hmm. I'm in southern Ontario, and uh, and uh, I try to get down to the states when I can. I really, really try to to do is uh, I I try to do it. And just so people know, um, and I'm not trying to uh, pick up work or anything, but when I teach in the states. Um, any, anything that gets made from the seminar is to do, donated to a local charity. I don't make money off it, just so everybody knows. I just so you do. So you do do seminars then? I do seminars. Yes, I do. I don't. I don't do a lot of them, mm-hmm. um, just because uh, you know I do have a home base and I, and I, I don't have any other instructor to teach. So if I if I go out and do seminars, um, unfortunately my students then don't get anybody to train them. <laughs> so, um, but uh, I'm doing a few more each year now. I do a lot in Ontario because it's usually like a one day of travel kind of thing. Sure. But the, the U.S. ones are few and far between right now, but I'm hoping to change that. Um, but there is a gentleman, like I said, in Boston, Massachusetts, who I have uh, trained uh, for, the next, for the last little while, and he is, he is uh, teaching students in Boston. Mm-hmm. Um, and I believe their website is kbuausa.com, and kbua is spelled C-E-A-D-B-U-A. Um, and I know Rob, his name's Rob Masson, mm-hmm. and uh, I know he's teaching right now. So if anybody's out in that area, in the Boston area, um, I'm sure Rob can, can give them a couple of lessons and whatnot. So Fantastic. doing what I can, but I, I, I try to get down to the States when I can. I love, I love going down to the States because everyone is so amazing when, when you give seminars, like yes. the, the, uh, the way they just absorb it. It's just, uh, it's phenomenal. <laughs> so yeah, I love it. Well, sir, uh, it was a, a pleasure speaking to you, and definitely uh, a pleasure hearing uh, hearing about your system as well as uh, hearing uh, about the history of the system and, and how it's uh, passed down uh, from father to son, and, and eventually how you finally got permission uh, from your father in order to teach. Uh, I'd like to thank you for your time, and uh, again, uh, it really has been a pleasure speaking to you. Uh, and you know what? Thank you so much, Mike, for for actually contacting me. Um, anytime uh, anybody does this to, <clears throat> to uh, get any kind of promotion for the Irish sticks out there, I'm I'm very grateful. Um, and also, I don't want it to always just be about uh, you know my style. There's a group down in Ohio, um, some recreationists that uh, have this single hand stick fighting. Um, they're in Ohio, I believe. Uh, and the, the gentleman's name is Ken Fangner. And if I'm not pronouncing his name right, I feel really bad. But um, he uh, he has a recreationist group that they do the single hand uh, Irish stick fighting. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know they're there. There's um, Jeff Cavanaugh in the Philadelphia area with John Hurley. They're doing uh, some Irish stick fighting as well. So it, it is not there's not just me. Uh, I don't want to ever give that kind of image that it's only I that do it. So sure. um, there there are other there are other guys out there. They're not doing obviously my family system, mm-hmm. but they they have um, you know tracked down the manuals and some books that have been out there from. Uh, some uh, historic manuals and whatnot, and they've pieced together uh, the systems and they practice uh, with each other and whatnot. So of course. Um, if you're in the Ohio area, you can probably look Ken up. Um, and uh, and uh, there's, uh, I think there's, oh, there's another group in, sorry, in Quebec that uh, learn, uh, and made Bada, that they learned from a gentleman in, in Northern Ireland. Uh, one of the, uh, the instructors flew over there. They're in, in Quebec City. 
um, and his name is Maxime Schwinard. Um, so there's, there's, there's that gentleman as well. He's doing another system. It's a one-handed system as well. Um, yeah, and then there's a group in Calgary that uh, they're kind of doing what they call the modern shillelagh. They're, just, they're, they're taking basically uh, any kind of stick techniques from any system and kind of trying to formulate like the most efficient kind of way to, to do combat kind of sure, stuff. Sure, sure. Um, so they're out there. Anyway, <laughs> I just I didn't want to give the image that uh, that I was the only one out there doing Irish stick fighting. So. Not a problem, not a problem. Anyway, thank you very much. But, uh, yeah, but thank you again for this opportunity, and I hope I didn't talk your ear off. No, no, not at all, not at all, not at all. It was quite <laughs> interesting, and that's uh, that's what I do. Uh, I, I expect... Uh, I expect my uh, my interview subjects to be able to uh, to express themselves and give as much detail as possible, so that our listeners have as much knowledge as possible. Oh, okay, well, thank you. <laughs> well, again, Mr. Doyle, it has been a pleasure. At this time, uh, I'll just uh, say good evening. Thank you so much.